Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. I would like to warmly welcome all of you who have joined us in our efforts to share the findings and insights from our Arizona research efforts. I'm Rolando Fernando, Director of Impact and Improvement with KnowledgeWorks Foundation. As part of our commitment to democratization of research and data, we would like to be mindful of helping our district and school partners make meaning of what we can and cannot infer from the research findings by providing guidance and appropriate context to what we are about to share. The recent research effort in Arizona has significantly contributed to our emerging understanding of systems change at the school, district, cohort, and state levels. As we pursue to scale the implementation of personalized competency-based learning, we would like to emphasize that although the outcomes analysis component of the research was executed by comparing schools that have implemented PCBL efforts with those that had not, the main thrust of the research is to look into systems-wide implementation impact across the entire cohort of four transformed districts in Arizona. As a corollary to the above point, neither school or district specific levels of implementation nor school and district level outcomes were part of the analysis. So we cannot infer from this study how individual schools or districts in the Arizona Personalized Learning Network compare to each other and the match comparison schools. Another important point to keep in mind in making sense of the findings of the research is that other factors, such as the size of the district wherein implementation is happening, pandemic interruption at the onset of implementation, variability of survey response rates across schools and districts, and other significant analytical factors must be taken under consideration when making sense of and interpreting the data. At present, we are actively looking at ways and means to pursue further analysis at the school and district levels of implementation in Arizona. So stay tuned. We are hoping for your continued partnership at every step of the way. Finally, there will be a short Q&A section after the sharing of the findings and insights. My colleague, Shelby Taylor, will be collecting your questions throughout the presentation and field them to our research partners within the allotted time. Please submit your questions via the chat function at any time. Without further ado, I would like to hand over the main portion of this webinar to our research partners from Research for Action, who will introduce themselves. Great. Yeah, thanks so much, Rolando, for, for that uh, terrific introduction. Um, so thank you all uh, for uh, joining us today on the webinar. We're excited to share this time with KnowledgeWorks. And uh, you know, thanks, thanks so much uh, for hosting this webinar. So we have the opportunity to, to share what we've been learning. Uh, my name is Mark Duffy. I'm a senior research associate at Research for Action uh, and served as the project director uh, for this study that we'll be discussing. Uh, for those not familiar with us, Research for Action is a nonprofit education research organization, and we're based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, and we actually have a portfolio of, of work in education that is taking place uh, across the country. And we've really been pleased to partner with KnowledgeWorks across, across a number of years, but in this case, specifically to deepen the qualitative data collection already underway um, through the development of case studies and summative implementation and outcomes analyses in Arizona. This mixed methods project uh, focused on understanding uh, the implementation of personalized company-based learning in Arizona, pers the Arizona personalized learning network districts. Um, if we go to, go to the next slide. Great. Um, so as you can see, there was summative implementation outcomes, analysis portion and, and case study uh, work as well. Uh, as Rolando was saying, um, 
the implementation outcomes data reflect findings from uh, the Arizona personal learning sites, and the case study findings provide a deeper dive into the learnings in the two sample districts, schools and districts that we focused on. Data collection was done during the 22-23 school year, um, and so that's when the, the uh, field work was conducted in the two leading schools and districts. Um, I'd also like to um, take this opportunity especially to thank anyone who's on the call who participated in the data collection in the schools and districts. Really appreciate your partnership in that data collection. Um, and um, just to note, we will include opportunities both at the middle and in the end of the, of, of the presentation for questions and discussion. Let me ask you to please keep your questions until then or put them in the chat um, and we'll try to address them at the midway point and then at the end. So with that, um, I'll turn the presentation over to my colleagues, uh, Corinne Gagenheimer, uh, Kevin Burgess, and Julia Ransom, who will be sharing the findings with you today, as well as Jay Kim, who will be um, fielding questions as needed. Um, so I'll pass it over to Corinne. Thanks, Mark. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Karin Gagenheimer. I'm a research associate at Research for Action. And I'm going to be walking us through the summative implementation and outcomes analysis portion of this presentation. And this analysis included three strands of research. So first, we were studying the implementation of personalized competency-based learning. Second, we looked at impacts on student outcomes. Third, we explored whether there is a relationship between levels of implementation and those student outcomes. And so what I'm going to do um, in this piece of the presentation is walk you through the key findings from each of these three strands of research. So starting first with implementation, um, I'll, I'll just orient you a bit to, to what we did before talking you through this slide. But to study implementation, we used data from student and teacher surveys that were uh, administered in the four implementing districts. And the surveys asked respondents to rate their perceptions of the level of implementation of core constructs of personalized competency-based learning. And so we were analyzing those survey data to look at how implementation varied across districts and over time. And so here, what we're showing on this slide is results just from the student survey. So, so looking at implementation from the lens of how students perceived it. And so what you're seeing in this table, um, I just said that the survey was implemented in four districts. What we're showing here is results from Amphitheater and Santa Cruz Valley because the data from the districts, the, the other districts was a bit more limited. So we're reporting here from districts that had um, comparable data that allows us to make inferences. So in this table, the column on the left shows those core constructs of personalized competency-based learning that were measured on the survey. And so for each of these constructs, students were rating their perceptions of implementation on a scale of one to four, where lower values indicate um, less evidence of implementation and higher values indicate stronger evidence of implementation. So what we show here is the average score for each construct measured in the survey. And you'll see we report it separately for each district um, in 2022, in 2023, and then that trend column shows the time trend or the difference between 2022 and 2023. So we can look to see whether there's uh, growth or change over time. And so we, uh, in terms of key takeaways, what do we find? Um, students perceived moderate to strong implementation. Um, so these construct scores you can see are generally falling in that two to three point range on the four point scale. Um, perceptions of implementation changed a little over time. So if you're looking at those trend scores, they're generally small in magnitude, saying there wasn't a ton of movement from 2022 to 2023. Um, and then we're also wanting to highlight student agency. So student agency, the construct um, shown near the bottom of the table, You'll notice that it was rated um, as the lowest construct in 2022, but it actually saw the highest levels of growth over time, indicating that students saw, you know, students perceived that implementation in this construct was really moving in a positive direction, becoming stronger over time.
Then we also looked at implementation from the teacher perspective. And so this table shows results from the teacher survey. And again, we're just showing results for districts with sufficient data. So for the teacher survey, that was Amphitheater, Mesa, and Santa Cruz Valley. And I think what you might notice here is that the constructs measured on the teacher survey look a little bit different from what we were just looking at um, in, the, in the table before, in that on the teacher survey, we were actually able to measure some sub-constructs. So the first two table, uh, the first two rows in this table, you'll see career, real world connection, and then a career portrait of a graduate. These are two sub constructs nested within the career readiness. And you'll see that we measured sub constructs for competency based learning. That's the competency rows, and then again for student agency near the bottom um, of the table. And so key takeaways from here, uh, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of numbers that you're looking at. Um, I think the main points here is that teachers generally perceive strong levels of implementation. So the average construct scores overall were generally falling in that uh, 2.5 to 3.8 range, which indicates strong implementation. Um, we find that teacher uh, perceptions of implementation improved over time. So the trend scores, uh, you know, there's some mix, but overall uh, tended to be positive and a little bit larger in magnitude. Um, and then we also wanted to highlight supportive relationships. So that's the construct right at the bottom of the table, but you'll notice that the average scores there are, you know, 3.66, 3.74, 3.8. And again, that's out of a four point scale. So it looks like implementation there uh, was really strong according to teachers. So I'll move us into the next strand of research here, which was um, estimating the impact of personalized competency-based learning on student outcomes. And Rolando was mentioning this, but for this analysis, what we did is we compared trends in student outcomes in those schools implementing PCBL compared to trends in student outcomes in schools that did not implement personalized competency-based learning. And importantly, our selection of those comparison schools of the non-implementing schools, they had similar trends in the pre-implementation period. So to estimate the impact, we looked at how trends differed between the two groups of schools in the post-implementation period. And so what we're looking at here is results for elementary schools. So I'll walk you a bit through um, what, you're, what you're seeing on the screen here. But the table on the left shows results for ELA, and this is the passing rate on the ELA state assessment. And then on the right, it shows results for math. And so in these figures, what you're seeing, the orange bars represent schools that are implementing personalized competency-based learning, and the blue bars represent schools that did not implement. And so the size of the bars shows the change in student outcomes in the post implementation period. And so what you're seeing here is that um, for both groups of schools, the blue and the orange bars are both moving in the negative direction, right? They're both facing downwards, indicating that both groups of schools experienced dips in student test score outcomes in the post implementation period. And I, I have to note here that you're probably thinking, okay, well, the, the start of PCBL also aligned with um, the start of COVID and, you know, schools across the state, across the country were experiencing dips in, in test score outcomes. And that's right. And what I would point your attention to here is actually the difference between um, the orange and the blue bars. And you'll notice that the PCBL schools shown in orange here are experiencing greater dips or more negative drops in student test score outcomes relative to the comparison schools that weren't implementing. And if you look at the, the top of the tables next to the years, you'll see that some years have asterisks next to them. The, the asterisk indicates whether the difference between PCBL and non-PCBL schools are statistically significant, 
which means that there's reason to believe that these differences didn't occur by chance and that we can actually you know, make something of it. So the, the key takeaway from this table is that in elementary schools, we find that PCBL schools uh, underperformed relative to their non-PCBL schools and that the differences were statistically significant in ELA in all years and in math just in 2022. And so now we're looking at middle schools. Um, it's the same setup with the figures, ELA on the left, math on the right. Um, you'll see in these figures, the differences between PCBL and non-PCBL schools are smaller, um, and they're actually not statistically significant in any year. So we say we don't see significant differences between PCBL and non-PCBL schools in ELA or in math in any year. All right, and now we're looking at uh, results for high schools, and you, you probably notice the trends here look a bit different. Um, so what I wanna do is I wanna draw your attention to 2022, which is uh, the year right in the middle of those figures. And this is the only year in which we saw significant differences between PCBL and non-PCBL schools. And the pattern here is actually in the opposite of direction of what we were seeing in elementary schools and that PCBL schools are actually outperforming uh, the comparison schools. So in ELA, we see that PCBL schools are experiencing greater gains than the non-PCBL schools. And then in math on the right, we see that PCBL schools are experiencing gains while the non-PCBL schools are actually still experiencing those dips in student outcomes. Um, so that's for ELA and math. Um, I'll also just note that we did look at uh, impacts on graduation and dropout rates uh, for our sample of high schools. We didn't find any statistically significant differences. Okay, and then the last piece um, was looking at the relationship between levels of implementation that we measured using the student and teacher survey data and those student outcomes. And so here what we did, we looked at school level correlations between the construct scores on the survey and student test score outcomes. And we didn't find evidence that there's a relationship between implementation and outcomes. Um, the correlations were generally small in magnitude and moved in, in different directions. And so there was not um, there was not evidence to support a relationship, um, which I have to I have to hedge with a couple caveats, which is that you know, this, this type of analysis was quite limited with the data that we had, um, particularly limitations of the survey data with response rates and sample sizes, and just the fact that, you know, implementation is, is still new, it's still ongoing, there were COVID disruptions, and that, you know, it could just be too early in stages of implementation to be able to pick up on a relationship there. And so um, I think I'll end this point by just noting that we, you know, we do need more data um, to be able to understand if there is a relationship there and also you know what what that relationship could look like too so main takeaways from our implementation and outcomes analysis um, what what should you take with from here um, students and teachers perceived moderate levels uh, moderate to strong i should say levels of implementation Teachers uh, perceived stronger levels of implementation than students did based on the survey data. Um, the impact of personalized competency-based learning on student outcomes is mixed, we find. So there was some evidence of negative differences in elementary schools, some evidence of positive differences in, in high schools, but overall I would say the evidence um, is mixed there. And then last, we don't detect a relationship between implementation and outcomes with the data that we have. I'll go ahead and pause there um, and we can we can do our first break for questions if there are any that have come up. Hi, Karen. Thank you. Um, no questions seem to have populated in the chat here. 
Okay, great. Well, we can uh, we can move into the discussion of case study findings, and then as questions come up, we'll have another chance at the end of the presentation. So folks can keep um, you know adding them to, into the chat if they come up, and uh, we can keep moving. So I'll turn it over to uh, Julia. Thank you. Um, as Mark mentioned, my name is Julia Ransom. I'm a research associate here at Research for Action. And myself and my colleague Kevin Burgess traveled to Arizona to um, conduct our case study data collection. And our research, our case study data collection, we had three strands for the research in Yuma Union um, High School District and Santa Cruz Valley Unified. And those were to explore district context for implementation of personalized competency-based learning in those two districts. Um, the second strand was we wanted to um, collect descriptions of personalized competency-based learning at the school level and collect perspectives of teachers, students, and parents. And lastly, we wanted to understand successes, challenges, and lessons learned from the case studies. And so in the summer and early fall of 2023, we conducted interviews and focus groups with a representative from the Center for the Future of Arizona, uh, representatives from KnowledgeWorks, district administrators, and school administrators. Uh, we then traveled to Arizona in October 2023 and visited two schools over the course of a week. We conducted observations in the classes you see listed um, on our slide. And we conducted focus groups with teachers while we were in Yuma and with teachers from Santa Cruz after the visit. And so our case study um, findings are framed, we ground discussion of implementation of personalized competency-based learning and knowledge works district conditions necessary for scaling. And those are reflected in our graphic here. And for each of the studies, several discussion points encompass multiple of those conditions. So where that is the case, uh, we reflect that in the discussion and in the slide. And with that, I will pass it to Kevin to discuss Yuma Union. Thanks, Julia. So uh, hi, everyone. My name is Kevin Burgess. I'm a senior uh, research analyst at Research for Action. So as Julia was mentioning, you know, I traveled uh, to Arizona with, with Julia to conduct uh, data collection uh, at Yuma and at Santa Cruz as well. Uh, and so I'll talk through a little bit of our findings based on our qualitative data collection at Ayuma. So uh, as Julia mentioned, we analyzed the data that we collected through the lens of the 12 district conditions that KnowledgeWorks has identified for scaling. And some of the themes were more readily observable from our data collection activities than others. Uh, and we highlighted the most prominent themes in our report. So first, I'll kind of talk through shared vision, this being kind of an overarching theme for trying to scale competency-based learning. And we found that Yuma has developed a common pedagogical purpose for PCBL implementation. And that has happened as a result of intentional policy shifts at the state, district, and school levels. So at the, at the state level, Arizona passed legislation, uh, the instructional uh, time model, which provides districts flexibility in terms of seat time. So uh, there's more flexibility to do things in different modalities. Uh, remotely, uh, and that gave students and schools a little bit more latitude uh, with uh, their pedagogy. Um, one of the big things that we're going to sort of talk about is standards-based grading, which is a big initiative in Yuma Union. So it's a different way of assessing students. So instead of having traditional grades, you know, from A to F, you have grades from one to four based on individual learning objectives. And instead of all of the, you know, one assessment, it being pretty much impossible to sort of parse out the individual learning objectives. You're not really sure how a student got that particular grade. At Yuma Union, they have it where each grade is based on uh, the learning objective. So you get scored specifically for that on a scale of one to four. So teachers are really integral in actually uh, starting that uh, process. They, the content area teachers uh, are part of the district design team pulled from the essential state standards to create learning objectives for the district. And then they also helped create proficiency scales or rubrics to uh, show or to articulate what students must know or be able to do in order to achieve different levels of mastery. 
Uh, along with that, there's a portrait of a graduate that the district had, and that informed the standard uh, standards-based grading implementation process as well. So there were six characteristics that the district, so administrators, and then also like teachers and faculty, and also the broader community uh, believe that uh, students should have when they graduate from uh, Human Union. And families did provide input in the, into this process as well. So uh, again, this sort of like informed uh, some of the objectives in the standards-based grading uh, system. And it was displayed prominently. There were like posters of, of the uh, portrait of a graduate that were plastered throughout the campus uh, of the case study school that we visited. Uh, and then in terms of leadership, uh, big thing was trying to empower school-based personnel who have the vital knowledges, uh, knowledge and experiences that they can share to help spread the work. And so teachers, like I mentioned, were on the district design team. So helping to, you know, initially implement uh, uh, PCBL when it became something that the district was going to do. Uh, Campus-based teams as well, uh, you know, worked on school-based sites to, you know, provide instruction and uh, professional development for teachers that were trying to implement this novel uh, system. And then also formal and informal PE at schools, which I'll talk a little bit more about on the next slide. So in terms of professional development and learning for teachers, uh, there were like online learning platforms uh, that teachers could access to uh, do training uh, about PCBL. Uh, teachers kind of uh, and administrators organized group observations of professional uh, personalized competency based learning at different schools. Uh, there were teacher led workshops where teachers that uh, had a little bit more experience doing PCBL. Uh, led the workshops and, and gave uh, other teachers advice on how to implement it themselves. And then, you know, for teachers, a lot of it's informal. So mentorship on campus, right? Not in any sort of formal setting, but just like talking about, hey, what's that cool thing that you're doing in your classroom? I'd like to try to, you know, implement that as well. Um, the big thing that we saw uh, was obviously in the curriculum instruction and comprehensive assessment systems. So we observed a few classes, you know, at Yuma and also at Santa Cruz. And in Yuma, what we saw were uh, proficiency scales that I mentioned uh, and rubrics utilized in a formative sense to guide individualized instruction. So, you know, there, there are assessments that they would be doing every day would sort of inform instruction the next day or even during that class. So we went to a math class and we saw students placed in strategic groups, a teacher gave an assessment, a formative assessment, like a really quick quiz. Based on the results of that, they grouped them into, you know, a high performing group, a lower performing group, and kind of a medium performing group. And they had different activities uh, based on which group they were on, just to make the uh, instruction more individualized based on what, what those students needed. Choice boards were a really big uh, strategy that was used. So it was not only, you know, how things were, uh, how teachers were teaching and what you know, how the style that they were using. There's also uh, how uh, students um, uh, demonstrated their knowledge. So choice boards basically gave students an option as to how to demonstrate mastery. So if you're not like a writer, they would, you know, maybe give you an opportunity to, uh, you know, do a, a documentary or something like that. So in like a, a couple of classrooms that we visited in world history, there was an opportunity for students to either write a news story or create an infographic or make a video about a historical topic that they were learning. In English, we saw uh, they had to do, you know, they had to write, that was mandatory, but uh, they could choose from one of four different prompts that most resonated with them to, you know, give them a little bit more agency and choice. And then in math, uh, you know, they had different uh, assignments as well on, on choice board and they could choose from two of the four activities that the teacher had uh, prepared beforehand. So with flexibility, we talked a little bit about flexibility at the uh, state level with, you know, the instructional time model and giving more, uh, you know, time uh, for different modalities of instruction. This is also done at the campus. So there were certain days that they called flex days at the campus that we visited, where uh, students could learn either in person or remotely to catch up or move ahead in the curriculum. Um, you know, with uh, personalized competency based learning, sometimes students are moving ahead, they're going at their own pace. Uh, so in certain days to make sure that, you know, students could catch up, like they would provide that opportunity 
uh, for those students that needed it to, to sort of catch up. And then students that were ahead, they could continue pushing ahead. So if they had mastered a particular learning objective, they could maybe push on to the next grade. And we saw that, you know, uh, in the math classroom that we visited. Um, and then in terms of learning supports, I already talked about kind of small grouping, uh, grouping uh, based on ability level. Uh, assessments were done uh, more, uh, instead of it being like a one and done, as in a traditional classroom, students could retake them multiple times to demonstrate growth. So it didn't necessarily matter when you uh, demonstrated mastery, it was more that you actually demonstrated it. And teachers kind of mentioned that this helped foster a growth mindset and more self-efficacy in students. And then technology was utilized to uh, implement PCBL as well. They had a learning management system in Yuma called Canvas. Uh, and there was like a mastery pass uh, program that they were using where students who were doing that essay that I mentioned before, uh, they would go down different pathways at certain points. There would be like a formative check, knowledge check. And based on whether they got a green, which meant good or red, which meant bad uh, or not so good, um, they would be prompted to do different things to kind of remediate. Um, and so that was another way to kind of build that into the structure of what they were doing and provide support for students. Um, and so uh, just to kind of talk about uh, the focus groups uh, that we had with teachers, students, and families, respondents generally had favorable impressions of PCBL. Uh, teachers shared that their intentional use of proficiency scale and rubrics was effective for students. So one way they were doing that was that they would give the students like the uh, rubric and proficiency scale for a specific learning objective and they'd have them uh, after their assessment, look at that and see you know, where they needed to remediate. They would have them come up with uh, individual plans of how they can learn and that like sort of helped them internalize both what they needed to know and you know, teachers reported that it made them you know, more engaged, uh, gave them more agency, uh, and they had more metacognitive skills. They were more aware of how they learned and, and what they needed to do to improve. But teachers also noted uh, a few challenges. The big thing was capacity. You know, implementing PCBL takes a lot of time. Some of the things that we uh, that we discussed earlier might require multiple lessons in one lesson. So one teacher creating like four different lessons for four different groups of students, which is you know very difficult to do without you know coordination. Um, a teacher was mentioning that like it would be good. It, we saw that you know PCBL was kind of piecemeal across Yuma, so certain teachers were more uh, apt to implement it than others. And so some teachers were talking about that lack of coordination being detrimental. So instead of having like an entire department doing you know the lesson, where if there were four different lessons that they had to do, like each could do one lesson, and then it was the same as like a teacher just doing one lesson, right? It, it, ordinarily. Um, that's not how it was necessarily. And so they felt kind of burdened. And then some teachers that were doing inclusion, they felt that a lot of the PCBL strategies didn't necessarily, uh, weren't geared towards uh, uh, marginalized students. So students uh, that were special education or where English was not their first language. And they wanted a little bit more instruction on how to, uh, you know, and professional development on how to support those students. Students for their part, they said that they, knew more about what they needed to do to improve. Yuma is a high school district, uh, meaning that it's just all high schools. So uh, the students that were coming from high school had been in non-PCBL schools for middle school, and they were saying that was a big change, that they were aware of what they needed to do to learn, and, and, uh, and, that, and that was just like a, a big shift, and they really enjoyed that. And they also appreciated having more voice and choice in the classroom. And then families, for their part, uh, they didn't really know much about the initiative of PCBL, but they did say that students seemed to uh, advocate for themselves more and that they also knew a little bit more about what they needed to do uh, to improve. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Julia, who will talk uh, about uh, Santa Cruz. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so as with Yuma, Santa Cruz used opportunities presented by the changes in legislation to create the conditions for personalized competency-based learning. Um, so district administrators and um, case study school respondents, so teachers, described a shared vision for the work, uh, which is that students take ownership of their learning and they had clear values to support that vision. And like Yuma, they also had their portrait of a graduate to drive their vision. 
um, which includes several attributes that they expect of their district graduates. Uh, more specifically, creative the graduates should be creative and critical thinkers, um, effective communicators, engaged citizens, and resilient lifelong learners. Um, and in Santa Cruz, we also found that student agency has increased at the case study school. Um, students were taking ownership of their learning through strategies, strategies such as tracking their own progress through learning goals and progress binders and leading their parents through student parent teacher conferences. Um, and teachers also reported providing students with more voice and choice. Um, and that they feel the freedom to create various ways for students to learn and demonstrate mastery in their classes. Um, and with curriculum instruction and comprehensive assessments, uh, the district, the Santa Cruz district adopted standards based grading. Um, so students work to, as this is the same, very similar to Yuma. Students work toward proficiency on each standard until they've met the goal instead of just moving on. Uh, whether they had proficiency or not. And so at this case, the case study school in particular, teachers were able to assign students work on their Chromebooks and gave all students diagnostic tests to individualize assignments and check proficiency. Um, and one administrator noted that in Santa Cruz, technological resources purchased within the district must align with personalized competency-based learning for them to invest in them. Um, and in Santa Cruz, there was also more flexibility in learning environment and uh, learner support provided. So the instructional time model provided Santa Cruz with the opportunity to create flexible learning environments. Uh, for example, students in the case study school were given 70 minutes, four days a week to receive one on one teacher attention and focus on the subject area where they need the most support. Uh, the physical space at this school that we examined was also flexible. So the case study school provided students with flexible seating. And in the school, they had different learning zones or centers that students could choose from based on their individual learning levels. And finally, teachers felt that um, more supportive relationships between teachers and students has encouraged students to feel comfortable acknowledging when they need help. This is thereby increasing the opportunities for them to provide that learning support. Um, in Santa Cruz for professional development and learning, um, along with the supports provided by KnowledgeWorks, educators at the case studies school have been able to showcase their instructional practices through the AZPLN Inquiry Lab, uh, where teachers present artifacts and examples of their professional or the personalized competency-based learning strategies to their coworkers and colleagues across the district. Um, teachers at the case study school have also had access to instructional coaches um, and teacher leaders at each grade level for support. And teachers also had access to online PD resources and technology in the district to further their professional development. Um, and for leadership development, Santa Cruz um, has structures in place at the district and school level to support leadership development. Um, the district design team is expected to engage in knowledge works training, pilot new practices, monitor implementation, and share their learnings with a broader staff audience. Uh, there is also what is called a coalition of the willing in Santa Cruz. So this was initially two teachers per school, but it has expanded. Um, and these teachers were strategically invited in the beginning of the work to participate in professional development and pilot personalized competency-based learning in their classrooms. And there's also um, school launch teams in Santa Cruz, which is four to seven teachers per school site who guide the work at the building level. Um, and at the case study school, every grade level has their lead teacher. And this lead teacher gathers other teachers together every six weeks to meet with and uh, each other and plan activities that are centered around uh, personalized competency-based learning. And I will review some respondent um, perspectives from Santa Cruz. So teachers and administrators, the teachers we spoke with shared that students wanted to learn and meet their goals. And students had more ways to show their learning and were enjoying learning and making choices. And this is a quote from one of the teachers. This teacher said, all the students make progress and they enjoy coming to school and are ready to learn as soon as they walk in. I am better at teaching 
and it is easier for me. All the strategies have improved teaching and learning. And when we spoke with family members, family members were aware of and appreciated the flexibility um, of the way that their children were learning. So one family member said, quote, I think it's working for the kids. They are more engaged. It's not a linear learning path. They can trail back to something they didn't learn before. The big subjects they do as a class, but they have the opportunity to revisit that subject. And then finally, when we spoke to students, they were aware that they were learning in a new way and they had become comfortable uh, working at their own pace. So students knew they had goals to reach when they were ready to reach them. And when asked if they have learning goals, when we conducted a focus group, they knew um, how they were progressing and meeting those goals. And one student noted, we have a binder where, we, where you move from I learn to I practice and then to I show. So students knew the process for how they move from one level or from one goal to another. Um, so our, the key takeaways from our um, case studies were that in Yuma and Santa Cruz, the districts have taken advantage of the state legislation changes uh, to create the conditions necessary for scale and implementation of personalized competency-based learning. And at both schools, uh, there was increased teacher leadership, student agency, student ownership of their learning. There were formative assessments in the curricula, and there was an increase in flexibility um, within how learners learn and within the classroom spaces. And with that, I will take any questions um, that people might have. Okay, again, we'd invite people to um, put your questions in the chat if you have any. Um, in the meantime, um, I might pose a question here uh, to the group about, um, you know, how how might this research inform um, future lines of research or what uh, areas for exploration um, might we consider uh, for future research in, in Arizona and implementation? I can start off with something that I think uh, is already on uh, your minds, at least, and just thinking about, you know, our study, uh, the impact study was very focused on um, do we see impacts on student test score outcomes? And, you know, Obviously, those are not those are important, but they may not be the only outcomes that we care about. And so, I think future lines of research can think uh, can think more, you know, about more proximal outcomes uh, in this sort of like chain of of logic and how we see the theory of action of personalized competency based learning playing out. But in terms of like, you know, do we see changes in attendance in behavior that then perhaps lead to changes? Um, in academic outcomes, because I think one of the takeaways, at least from the from the impact study, is that you know the evidence is mixed right now, but it could just that you know it takes a long it takes a lot of work to move test score outcomes, and it could just be that you know uh, there hasn't been enough time implementing this to be able to see to see changes in, there. But perhaps we do see changes in other outcomes that are, are a little bit more proximal to the intervention itself. I would just add um, that because of the organic nature of the implementation of, of this work, um, you know, I, I think Julia and Kevin especially are making the point that, you know, there could be real variation. And I think, you know, the survey didn't you so far, but I think there might be value in doing qualitative data collection, um, looking at you know, the degree to which uh, implementation is taking place and the fidelity of implementation um, to see if, there be patterns uh, drawn out uh, in terms of the level of implementation, and that may help to explain um, some of the outcomes. Uh, you know, the, the data that we were collecting, you know, we were focusing just on two high flying schools, um, but we're looking at even a, sub, a subgroup of, of teachers within those schools and students within those schools. So, a broader um, uh, implementation study might, might really, you know, provide some value to 
provide more context around around the findings and would just echo uh, Karin's uh, suggestions about uh, using uh, data measures that are more proximal. It's, it's just very hard to move the needle, especially during you know a pandemic um, in terms of standardized test scores. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, a follow up to that would be um, as a researchers, are are there any of these findings that were particularly surprising to you? Uh, the the, the uh, lack of uh, positive movement as compared to middle and high schools was surprising in elementary schools. Um, oftentimes with personalized constantly based learning, you're seeing the, the highest level of implementation, the fastest uptake uh, across the school at the elementary level and slower uh, implementation at the high school level. And so, you know, this speaks to the fact that, of course, education reform is, is never happening, you know, in an isolated bubble. There are lots of things going on. There were other initiatives taking place um, at the high schools where we were. And so that may explain part of it. That, that was surprising that, um, that we weren't seeing uh, that we were, we were seeing the most positive uh, movement at the high school level, and not so much at the elementary level. But ahead of time, I would have expected the, the opposite. Interesting. Thank you. And I think I would just add to that point. Um, if you, if you think about the timing with um, this intervention. Uh, happening at the same time as COVID, and you think about differential challenges of COVID in the elementary context versus the high school context, that can sort of, you know, that sort of helps provide some clues, um, maybe as to why we're seeing that, like if, you know, if it's harder to do remote learning and to bounce back from COVID in the elementary context with younger students than it is for older students, and then uh, personalized competency-based learning, you know, coupled on top of that. Um, you know, it's a it's a potential explanation, and I, you know, we can't say for sure, uh, you know, what's going on here. And I think that would, you know, that's further further reason to do more of an more of a, like an in depth and thorough implementation study, so we can like maybe start to unpack some of those differences. Um, so I just thought I'd put that out there as well. Appreciate it, and um, I think really the only other question I might throw to the group is. Um, for those folks who are implementing um, the work um, in Arizona, how might you suggest they use these findings or learn more about this work? So I think maybe one thing is, uh, even though the the I'll speak to the you know to the survey and the outcomes analysis. So even those are even though those uh, findings that research is at a much higher level than at an individual school, I think it's worth um, using the research sort of as a uh, opportunity for reflection um, to say you know to what extent do these results that are conducted at a very high level do they resonate with your experience? in your local school, your local context, um, particularly maybe, you know, looking at the survey results um, around implementation, do you see in, in your local school that uh, implementation has been stronger in some of the areas that we find it? Um, is it, you know, do you think that teachers and students perceive different levels of implementation as, as we did? And so, you know, to what extent do, do these findings resonate with with your own experience and what ways do they not? Why is that so? What are you doing differently? Are you doing things that could be shared with others in the network sort of as a, as a link to uh, share learnings and build a stronger foundation for implementation overall? I actually was going to rewind to the previous question and just say something that surprised me was um, at this one school that we were able to, it, the one elementary school we were able to visit, although the results for the impact study said there was, you know, not as much of an implementation and, and uptake there. Despite that, the school that we did observe, there was a lot of buy-in and just, you know, knowing and a lot of teacher research, a lot of new curriculum, and a lot of PD teachers get fatigued with that kind of thing. So it's just really surprising and really wonderful to see how much buy-in the teachers had at this one school. Um, and then what I would say people can take away is kind of 
you know, looking at some of the strategies that these two schools used that somehow they were able to make some success and some headway with implementation, um, despite the fact that it can be piecemeal sometimes. So, you know, kind of take the best of what you're able to see in these schools and what might be applicable for your site and see, you know, what might work well. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I would just piggyback on that. That yeah, I think the case studies provide you know kind of wonderful examples for you know other schools in Arizona, but also in, in other places um, that are looking to do this work. They really do a nice deep dive in showing what personalized competency based learning can look like on the ground um, in places where you know, as as Julia was saying, there really is a strong sense of buy in and ownership in the work and excitement about the work. Uh, because, you know, so often, I mean, one of the things I, I, that I really love about the work that, that these folks are doing are these inquiry labs that we talk about uh, in the case studies where, you know, faculty get to go and see what their colleagues are doing. And the case studies aren't quite as powerful, I don't think, as, as, a, as actually going and observing, but it certainly provides some stories about, about what can be done. And, you know, whether you're a teacher or a policymaker or, you know, whatever kind of work you're doing, uh, there's a there's a lot of value in in learning the lessons from people who are doing the same sort of work that you are. So I really hope that people from from Arizona and elsewhere will use those case studies as as examples of of what they can do in their own context. Perfect. Thank you. Um, well, I see no other questions coming in, so I will. Um, go ahead and toss it back over to my friend Rolando to give some closing remarks. And uh, thank you all for, for being here today. Thank you, Shelby. Um, as we close the webinar proper, I would like to extend our heartfelt thanks to our partners from Research for Action, Mark, Day, Karen, Julia, and Kevin, to my colleague Shelby, Kayla, and the rest of my teammates at KnowledgeWorks, and to all of you who took the time to join us this afternoon, have a pleasant rest of your day. Thank you.